Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to episode four in season two, I think, of the second series of Hocus Focus. I'm Thomas Sheridan. And I'm Sarah Mondaini. And we both like to thank you for the fantastic response we got again to last week's shows. The previous show broke the record on my channel for the number of viewers in a specific time frame. And I think you've done the same with yours, Sarah. And last time I looked, you were racing towards 5,000 in 24 hours, which is great. That's a, a big increase. We've had a big increase in numbers since we did the BBC show two weeks ago. And I think that show was shared around. So it just shows you the importance of sharing the show because it does bring more people in and it does, uh, it, it helps everybody in the end, you know, all, all boats rise when the when the, the water rises. So how have you been doing this week, Sarah? Oh, I've had a busy week. Um, last week I had a couple of things to edit and get uploaded. Plus I'm learning a professional editing software, which slowed me right down because it was like working in another language. Okay. So there's been lots of swearing and tearing my hair out, but now I'm slowly mastering it. And hopefully you guys will see some improvements with my editing and content going forward. Fingers crossed. But other than that, a few late nights trying to catch up. Um, but it's been a good week. And thanks, yeah. everyone, for last week's response to the show. And I really enjoyed that live chat and reading all the comments. And those comments are there for you to carry on the conversation. So please, uh, thank you for doing that. And please continue. And as Thomas said, Series 2 is really taking off and getting bigger, and it is wonderful to see it fly. Uh, it's really interesting about you doing a new video suite because your standard was already pretty high, so I guess it's going to be, we'll be expecting something spectacular. Yeah, there might be a few more bells and whistles on the future episodes, yeah. Great stuff. Okay, Tonight we're not going to have a series of top or you know specific topics again like we do because a lot of paranormal stuff came up in the last few days that I say I keep meaning to talk about this I keep meaning to talk about this but it hasn't been hasn't been plugged in yet and one of the things I want to talk about I've been meaning to talk about this for a while because I've seen these things and what it is is what you call the will of the wisp in North America they're referred to spook lights now these are lights that appear generally over bogland or old marshes, not salt marshes. They have to be freshwater marshes and small ponds and those kinds of areas. Now, the prevailing theory is in the mainstream that this is methane gas from decaying matter at the bottom of the lake or inside the bog, and it comes up. And I do agree with that. That makes perfect sense. When it comes up, it ignites. And that's OK. I'm totally down with that. However, that's only half the story, because many people will tell you that when they look at these things, yes, it's methane gas. Yes, it seems to hold, but it doesn't burn out. It remains. And also, this methane gas seems this light, these will the wisp these spook lights seem to respond to you watching them. They seem to have an intelligence about them. They seem to have... If you move around, they can, will move around with you. Often, if you signal, they will signal back. They're very interesting in that they do have a natural combustive element. It, it would seem, I would generally agree with that. But at the same time, too, they also definitely have the same kind of intelligence uh, that people talk about in in you know, strange lights like UFOs and things like this. Now, I first saw them on a bog not too far from here. And it was one late one evening when I was coming back. And I used to walk across the bogs at sundown and it was getting dark. And I saw the Will of the Wisp pop up. It was like uh, a light that danced. Now, I, I don't think it was ball lightning because it didn't move that way. The, the, the flame or whatever it was was more kind of modulating in that sense. So it definitely had a fire kind of feel about it. But as I walked by, I said, oh, I was thinking to myself, oh, that's neat. I finally seen a will of the wisp that so many people in, in the countryside have seen. The thing seemed to be following alongside me. It seemed to be moving along with me. And when I stopped walking, it stopped moving. And this bog, I'd also had the experience of seeing black helicopters. Yes, I've seen black helicopters on this same bog. And I have... There are theories surrounding uh, the will of the wisp that it's 
their spirits. It's a, a nature spirit of some kind. It's born out of people who died in the bog trying to lure people back into the water because they, there's loneliness there. Now, that's actually an interesting theory because I was nearly eaten by a lake in New England once, uh, an icy bank I slipped on, and I had the impression it was it, it wanted me in there. And initially I thought, well, maybe it's about, you know, the lake is sentient and it wants to replenish its nutrients. Classic animism. But I also think, this, I've heard other stories in folklore, that people who perished in the lake, their ghosts remain there. And their ghosts are basically lonely. And what they do is they try to get people in, trap them to fall into the bog, die in the bog, and basically keep them company. So th I think that was a very interesting theory too. So I'm kind of torn between the three things. One, it's some kind of natural phenomena that your consciousness attaches itself to in some manner. It, probably like when you can bust clouds with your brain, it's probably an accessible form of you know, plasma or matter. Two, it's actually a sentient animism type thing that the bog or the pond wants to lure, wants to eat you, literally to get your nutrients, lure you in. <clears throat> excuse me. And finally, that it's the ghost of people who perished in the bogs or the pond or the swamp or the marsh, and they're trying to lure you in to keep them company. So, do you have any? Have you looked into the will of the wisp thing much, Sarah? We have something around here that could be a willow, a will of the wisp, which is the Longendale lights, which we've talked about before over the moors. They've been there for centuries, forever, um, but they're said to have caused accidents up there because they've uh, we've had planes flying over and um, they've distracted the pilot apparently and planes have gone down in the area. We don't know if they're UFO. Well, obviously they're UFOs. It's an unidentified flying object, but we don't know if it's um, fair fay or if it's um, ghostly phantom or if it's actually alien and those upland those moors they're like upland bog aren't they they're poor soil swampy and damp aren't they absolutely you can't go walking up there without accidentally bog hopping yes yeah it's quite it's dangerous up there if you don't know where you're walking and you would have what we call in our tour locks like temporary lakes and ponds that appear up there uh, when the marsh is filled in, in winter time, well, it's summertime now. It's been so rainy, but I, the, uh, I, when I heard, when I was thinking about the concept of the lights, I kept thinking of the, the concept of the gin, uh, because the gin are. We go into a bit of detail on this in our forthcoming book, but the gin are said to be of smokeless fire, and that to me would suggest plasma. And a lot, and these will of the wisp spook, spook lights do seem to look like they have a plasma effect. There's almost like a kind of a flashlight arc, like slight slightness to them, slight energy to them. And in the fairy folklore, we have fairy lights. There's a place near here called Creevy Kale Court Cairn, which up until 1935 locals wouldn't go near it it's a megalithic it's a neolithic chamber a megalith and people wouldn't go near it uh, because it, it was the they said it was the domain of what they call dangerous fairies the bad ones really bad ones uh like slow like vampire vampiric fairies and they were seeing the lights around there at night in 1935 our harvard university from america decided to got permission from the Irish government to excavate the site and the lights and the fairies were never, were never seen or felt again after they excavated the place. Now that's just like the gin. The gin like remote places. They like caves. They like all the abandoned mines. They like old factories, old rundown buildings. So it seems to me that we could have our own version of the gin in the West and it's the will of the West because what is a bog? What is a marsh? What is a, a pond in the middle of a deep forest? Well, it's extremely remote. It's not a place where humans go. And what we know about the gin is, and they do not like being around humans. Right. There's a, I think it's in Wales. They believe that it is a fairy, fa fairy flame, which is carried in the hands of goblins and other nature spirits. 
So that would tie in with that. I, I find I I wonder, you know, I was reading about uh, there's a there's a, a religious text in Ireland called the Book of Armagh, and it talks about how the fairies don't exist anymore in Ireland because Christianity got rid of them, and the only people there's only some people left who can see the fairies and funny enough in the greek orthodox church has a similar belief that christianity there's some kind of software in christianity that prevents you from seeing them and in islam is the same you don't normally see the jinn unless they want you to see them so i often think there's a theory that like if you're sensitive if you're open if you're an open-minded person who believes in the far paranormal, the 40 and whatever, the spiritual world, that they will make themselves known to you. It could be the way they travel about because they're all with the circular, aren't they? Yeah. Well, um, that kind of pulsating circular, like a ball, but not like ball lightning, but a bit more wobbly. Yes. Like an orb, like what an orb, what you see on a photograph. Yes. Um, but they, they're more, they're less, they're less circular. They kind of, wobble a bit jelly yeah 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 that kind of a thing yeah yeah and that could be how if it, if it is the gin that could be how they get around in this realm yeah now or else we have a fairy here that's very similar to a gin but maybe like in islam they believe that jin, not all jinns are muslims that there are non-muslim jinns and maybe that's what fairies are you know on top of like that that could be interesting too what do you think about orbs let me tell you something about the orb thing for us to go. I would generally be of the belief that it's water vapor in many cases, but something happened to me about 20 years ago that changed my mind completely. There, that there could be something to these orbs. Two incidents happened. One was a, 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 an old house over here that I've made music videos. If you go to the Thomas Sheridan art, our Thomas Sheridan channel on YouTube, the, the original one, and go back about 12 years of some music videos that I filmed in these places, in this particular house. Well, actually, just three instances, not just one instance, two two instances. There's a third one I'll tell you about later. It's just a slightly different thing. And I was taking photographs inside the house, and I captured, and because it was dark, I used a long exposure. It was on. It was a, a 35 millimeter film camera so a slightly long exposure with the aperture open and i caught a light that was incredibly bright but was not emanating light if you could understand that it was not throwing off it didn't throw light off it was condensed in itself it had it was captured on the picture coming forward and then there was a because the house is old and abandoned i had trees growing inside it and it deliberately went over a branch. Like it went and avoided the branch and went over it. And I got that one. That was that that was one that left me thinking, well, maybe, there, and it was an Orby kind of thing. Now, one that really happened, and I'll never forget this, is I was near Ballymore Castle, and the train station is beside the castle. And it's a very old castle from the Middle Ages, and it's a gigantic, it's in ruins now, of course, it was a, but it was a military one. But it's, I mean, it still has its four big walls. And the local council built a small un pedestrian underpass that went under the road to the train station to go visit the castle uh, from the train station area. So I got off the train station at Ballymote and the person, the, the person that was picking me up was late and told me they'd be a bit late. So I went for a walk in the dark over, at late at night over to the castle over to the, the castle and when i got into the pedestrian tunnel i said oh this is pretty cool uh, i've got to get a photograph of this because i reckon i like the way that it was a concrete circular pedestrian tunnel and i, I had a it's very inexpensive cheap digital camera i clicked it and i saw millions of orbs all around me in my eyes now in my eyes i saw them all around my head all around here and they were all over the photograph. They were living in this tunnel under the road between the castle and the train station, which not many people go to, not at night anyway. And they were nowhere else. I took a photograph outside it. They weren't there. 
I took a photograph inside. Now, here's the thing. It was a dry evening. So how do you, what do you think? So although I would be inclined to think the water vapor, I've seen things and heard things and experienced things that make me wonder, is there, are there something else too, you know? I had an experience myself about 2014. I was working in a building um, and it was next door to the police station where the cells were that they held Hindley and Brady. And I was in the building next door and um, there was a way of getting in to the cells underground. So I went down for a, for a nosy for a walk through there because it was, it was also used as a storage area as well. And I went through for a walk and um, as I walked down the steps and along where the cells are into this area that was be currently being used as a storage area, I looked up into the darkness because it was dark and there was just hundreds of twinkling um, lights that I can only describe as they look like fairy lights going on and off. And did they remain the whole time you were looking at them or just for a few seconds and vanished? They were twinkling for a few seconds and then they vanished but then while you're down there and you look again they would sort of go here then there then here like they were still there but not not as many i'll tell you the third one i have it's probably close it's probably a nature spirit but closer to that at the will of the wisp i was recording video of a stream in the mountains and so i left the camera on the tripod and videotaped the stream for incidental footage. I wasn't looking for anything. And it's possibly the most amazing thing I've ever captured on video. I do have it somewhere where I can't find it. Above a fast-flowing stream, it wasn't a slow-moving stream. It was fast-flowing. A light suddenly appeared and went off. Above the waterfall. Open, close. I saw it, it vanished. And I slowed down that the film camera had had 30 frames a second. So it was very difficult to slow it down very, very well. But I slowed it down enough to see that this thing appeared out of the void, lit up to about the size of a, a baseball, a grapefruit, and then collapsed in on itself. Now, that was... That, to me, was probably the best thing I've ever captured on film in terms of a paranormal thing, because it absolutely was indisputable. It was in a remote mountain valley. It was in a place known for the fairies. And I believe that I actually captured the real thing then. And it opened, it gave me a show. It gave, it, it manifested and gave me a show. And, but this was, that, see, this is what, this is why it wasn't a will of the whispering. It wasn't a stagnant water like a pool of or a marsh. It was a fast flowing thing and it didn't move around. It just goes to show you the, the level of these things that exist, how many of them there are at this for not this light phenomenon. I think the forest and the woodlands and the mountains are full of nature spirits. It's, a, it's another world that we're not, that not everybody's privy to, even those people who go walking down there. And I think sometimes it does show itself that that realm does show itself and I think we see in our realm as flashing lights um orbs or uh sounds plasma yeah sounds and plasma and flashes yeah about eight years ago I captured an entity of some kind in a jar I made a video about it on my original Thomas Sharon channel it was at Lichine House when you could get access to it which is one of the most haunted houses in Ireland and I created a basically a device to capture a demon that's what I call it anyway. The thing was that it had it was basically a jar with a sigil on the bottom that was to draw the thing's attention in. It passed through a, a layer uh, that was a wooden layer at the top of the jar, but on the inside, the underside was painted with lead paint. The, the thing is what that once it went through this hole, which was actually a copper rod, it was trapped on the other side and couldn't get back out. And I put inside it an audio recorder a zoom small digital audio recorder recorded nine hours of audio and the video is there for you to listen to to my amazement there sounds like some kind of creature in there who's protesting that they've been trapped it looks it sounds angry it sounds annoyed it sounds pissed off and so then i felt really guilty about it 
So I took the jar back to where I took it from and smashed it and destroyed the, the sigil. But it made me, it was one of those things that taught me that, you know, apart from your own safety, you may be dealing with something that means you no harm and you've trapped it like an animal. And what I thought would be an interesting experience turned out to be something that was very real, that rather than made me feel excited, made me feel guilty. Yeah, I think you have to be careful because they're going about their business or it was going about its business and then it found itself captured in a jar. So it's either going to be one of two things, very angry or very distressed. And you don't know what it's capable of then when you let it out. Yeah, so it was like, like complaining. You know, like a, a cat is annoying, the cat has complained. Going, going, yeah. It was like that, but speed it up at a, a difference. And you could actually, the, the clarity of the audio recording without me amplifying it or anything was what really blew my mind. Did you get an image in your mind of what it might have looked like just from the sound of the voice? Small little thing, like a bee or something. You know, like the size of a bee or something like that yeah i mean they did didn't but what it looked like i don't know but i got a, a feeling of its size and it's um uh, you know what was em what the kind of size that was emanating that sound and it was like something about like a bumblebee size and do you think it just flew off and went back to wherever it come from well afterwards? i had no choice because I, I opened the jar took out a sigil and took the lid off and destroyed the lid and, and left the jar there. So, yeah, it, it definitely went off to where it came from. I didn't go back and check, but it, I brought it back home, put it that way. Feeling guilt. Right. Feeling guilt. Yeah. And I was like... And quite I, I, rightly, too. Like I, I felt like I'd, I'd have trapped a baby bunny rabbit or something and everything was all upset by mistake, you know, a live one. And I trapped it, and you know, I've trapped, and I thought, oh no, I got a bunny rabbit, you know, and I feel bad, a baby bunny rabbit, and I feel awful about it. I felt like that, which is uh, uh, that's what really struck me more than anything else. But I, I did the VON with that on it, and a lot of people were freaked out by it. But uh, it I was. Oh, no, it does, yeah. Sorry. No, it I makes you think. Sorry, Thomas. Oh, you go ahead. I've spoken enough. Sorry. I was just saying, it makes you think. You made me think there. Do these things have lives and families of their own that they're trying to get back to well according to the islamic thing of the jinn they do they do they have they they live like us but in the dimension they have food they have a lifespan they have to eat they have to drink and they t they have families and stuff like that so yeah why not why not in their own version of it you know we we make the assumption that we only have these things ourselves but if the animal world has it, which we know it does in many species, so why wouldn't this the, the supernatural world not, not have it or have it? Yeah. Have its own system and ways of living. Yeah. Because with the fair with the fae, the fairies, um a lot of sightings that they've clothed, they've got shoes on and they've got clothes on. Where did they get those shoes and clothes from? Oh, and they even have people who go on the fairyland, they have farms and they keep livestock and they go to war. There's a very famous painting called The War of the Fairies. It's a fantastic watercolour in the National Museum of Ireland. And they take it out every January because they don't show it during the, the summer months to keep the, the colours safe. And it shows like a little fairy army with pikes and swords and hammers and clubs going off to fight another fairy army. So they, they're, the fairies have wars too as well. There's different tribes of fairies. Perhaps we are the intruders to them. Perhaps we're the demons to them. Yeah, exactly. But then again, they... Perhaps in their fairy folklore, we're the ones to stay away from. Well, that you'd say that, but... With both the she, the fairies, and the jinn... They, they have an advantage over us is that they can see us, but we can't see them unless they make themselves visible to us, which autumn, the fact that they're in, they're invisible to us, but can see us automatically gives them an advantage, especially when it comes to things like changelings, right? They can see the baby and do it. Or like in the, the William Yates, Butler Yates story, Land of Heart's Desire, the fairy girl arrives on the way the, the wedding of a, a young girl and tries to seduce her 
to go live with her back in the fairy world. And in the Islamic world, often jinns will take the shape of humans if they fall in love with a human person. And the royal family of Oman, I think it is, or one of, one of those countries in the, in the Gulf states, actually boast about being descendants of jinns. I mean, this is, uh, they take, you know, you know, in the West, we've been told this stuff isn't real. But in other parts of the world, they take this stuff very seriously. Is that where the saying comes from about the gods will um, procreate with the daughters of man? What what saying is that? I didn't hear it. It was a saying. I think it's biblical about the gods procreating with the daughters of man. Oh, that was wasn't that that wasn't that the uh, the nephilims and stuff like that. Yeah, I've heard about that. That they would take the women. Yeah, that's an interesting one. That and that makes you also think about, and we'll talk about this in a bit of alien abduction experiences because so many of the, the stories are very similar to the changeling thing in that they're interested in babies procreation eggs and that kind of thing And on this week's Folk Horror Cinema, we are featuring the 2013 film called The Borderlands, directed and written by Elliot Goldner. Now, this film is probably the most folk horror genre type film we've had since we began this series on Hocus Pocus. And because it's the first of its kind, we have a special guest on to help us with the review, which will be Christian Morris, which we'll have in a little while. The 2013 film, The Borderlands, is quite possibly the most terrifying film I've seen in a very long time. It has all the elements of plausibility coupled with the classic tropes you would find inside Lovecraftian or British cosmic horror in the style of Quatermass, The, the Wicker Man, and so on. It stars Gordon Kennedy as a Scottish brother called Deacon, who's a phenomenal character in the story who's kind of the central character kind of a cynical priest who's carrying ghosts inside him from a failed exorcist exorcism that went on a guy called Robert Hill who plays a techie called Gray Parker who's kind of like the average guy trying to understand the world of these Catholic priests and what they're up to Aidan McArdle plays a far, father Mark Adama, Ad, Amadon it sounds very much like the Irish word Amadon, which means moron, but a father, Mark Amadon, who is a career focused, kind of like upwardly mobile Catholic priest trying to make a name for himself in the Vatican. Patrick Godfrey is Father Calvino and a big shot in the in the in the Vatican who comes over to help him towards the end of the film. And Luke Neal as Father Krillick, the parish priest inside this rural parish in England, where he claims to have experienced a miracle. The team arrives in order to record, and that's the purpose of Gray Parker. He has to record and videotape everything for the Vatican. Now, uh, the initial thing is that during a baptism service, the altar shook, the crucifix fell over, and a strange noise was heard. So they set about using technology to try and figure out that the priest had faked it. Now, Deacon and Adam Amadon both don't believe it. But ironically, Parker, who's the techie, is like, this looks like the real thing. And he's, you know, this is a guy who's used to using high tech equipment. And he's more likely to believe that it's a really is an actual possession or miracle or supernatural event inside this church. Eventually, a series of events happen including a, a father, Amadon, who is injured during a, a supernatural event. And Father Calvino comes over from Italy by helicopter to arrive there. And he shows them that this church is built on a pagan ground. And the people who lived here in pagan times worship this entity with a sigil that a previous 
parish tree priest in the in the in the eighteen hundreds had also discovered. And this, what happens is before this, Father Krillick commits suicide uh, because he's starting to realize, as we find out with the previous parish priest, that he's falling under the power of this entity below the church, which they discover is behind a bookcase that leads into an underground passageway. We Then the story gets very Lovecraftian indeed. They go down into the depths of the church at the end. And what takes place is basically they find themselves in the digestive tract of a kind of a being that lives underneath the church. And at the very end, the final scenes show if. Uh, Brother Deacon and Gray Parker are both being dissolved by the digestive fluids inside this entity. If you're any way squeamish about claustrophobia, it will frighten the bisto out of you. I think it's an absolute fantastic film. I give it a 10 out of 10. I think it defines and sets the folk horror genre. It also is part of the found footage genre, and you think that would have been washed up after the Blair Witch Project, but if anything, the only reason why the Blair Witch Project is better is because it did uh, the the found footage genre, genre first before anyone. Otherwise, I give the Borderlands 10 out of 10. It has some very horrific scenes and frightening scenes, which we'll talk about in a minute. So, Sarah, and especially welcome Christian Morris. Thank you for agreeing to do this. Uh, we're glad you're here to give us a, a curveball into these reviews because I always enjoy your movie reviews. If you don't know who Christian is, he's on Odyssey. He's an Irish intellectual, I guess, uh, and pundit. And he's a very well-spoken, highly educated man who's a lot of fun. And But he did two reviews in the past on his own initiative, one of The Wicker Man and one of the Stephen King film, The Mist. And he threw a curveball into both of those stories that I never would have considered otherwise. So that's why we brought him on a special guest for the Borderland this week. So welcome, Christian. Tell Thank us what you. you felt. Like. Tell us what you what you how you feel about the Borderland. Well, Go speaking back. of horror films, I decided to emulate. Just people are wondering what I was emulating. I'm emulating another horror film, Ken and the Barbie movie. So that's another horror film that, oh, that we, don't need, horror film, yeah. Yeah, we don't need to review it tonight. Um, Hocus, yeah. The Borderlands is a film that when I watched it the second time preparing for tonight, I watched effectively a different film. And it's a profoundly moral film. And I would draw comparisons, there's going to be spoiler alerts here, to The Fog, John Carpenter's film in the US from 1980. Yeah. The Wicker Man, that brilliant British film from 1973, and The Ninth Gate from 1999. And the what it would have in common with the fog was the use of the church as a focal point. So the fog, John Carpenter's film uses the fog as, and these are, there are spoiler alerts. Everybody in all of these films are going to talk about, but in the fog, the church carries a dark secret, and it is not what it seems. And this is the same now with. Uh, the Borderlands, uh, the fog, the church was was built with stolen money from a leper colony and a curse was put on the church and on the village. Is there a curse on this village and on this church? No, I don't think so. In the Borderlands, I don't think so. But they're dodgy places that you need to keep away from. Um, what it has in common with the Wicker Man is the pagan morality, of course. They all went there of their own. These four Egypts. Egypts went of they are Egypts in different ways, shapes, and sizes. These men who went there and ended, ended up getting killed, quite aside from Father Krellick, who seemed to kill himself of his own volition. The four others went and got themselves killed by their own free will. What defines this film more than The Wicker Man or more than those other pagan films, The Ninth Gate, or so and so forth, so on and so forth, is that this film has the warnings coming along from pretty much day one. So they arrive, Deacon and Gray arrive in the village and they stop to talk to somebody and, you know, he just stares at them. And then they spot tape along a gate, which is a satanic thing. Oh, no, doesn't register on them. Then there's a man hanging around the church. Oh, no, doesn't register on them. Then they go to the pub and nobody is friendly to them. And when they arrive also, and this is identical, I would I would wager that the director, um, Goldner, got this from the fog. When they arrive on the first night, the bells in the church start ringing on their own. 
That was one of the features of the fog. Once the night of the curse began at midnight, the bells in the church in the fog began ringing on their own. And I remember thinking at the time that was a fabulous image, the bells in the church ringing on their own. And this happened in the borderlands as well. The bells rang at their own volition. And now, one of the features of sorry, the borderlands... Hold it, sorry, Christian, hold it right there. We bring Sarah in, then you can continue. But I, I want to just get you at that point. That's very well noted about the tape on the, the gate that had the satanic curse on magnetic tape, but also the grey and deacon walking up the hill and a black dog, a domestic dog, is devouring a rabbit or a hare. And he says something like, not nature, that's what it is. Big things eating little things. And that should have been a, no domestic dog eats a wild animal like that in that style. That's right. And, that's and right. I was in the church grounds. Sarah, uh, give us your input now before we bring Christian back on. Well, I thought the film was terrifying and I couldn't get it out of my head and I still can't get it out of my head. It's really disturbing and I've been going over it and over it how these ordinary men would come to do a job but then became trapped from the moment they entered the village and from the moment that they stopped in the car to ask directions to the old man who was, I think he was cycling along and the old man just stood there and looked at him and I thought, now there's something wrong here. There's something wrong with these people here. It's not right. And then the the dog was eating the rabbit and I think it was Grey that said, big things eat little things. Yeah. And I just thought that's, there's an augury here. This not this is not good. Um, and I think at that point when they arrived and the dog was eating the rabbit, I think that that's when the entity underground felt their arrival and saw them being a potential for new feeders for it. But then as the film went on, it realised that these men weren't going to be staying around to feed it like in the past, the old priest in the past. Yeah. So it decided that these three men were going to be its food instead. And I think they lured them to it slowly and um, stealthily all the way through the film and they just ignored every single warning and augury and they right. everything everything they were shown they just passed it off as either being one of those things or um just something scientific that's back right to, absolutely back to you christian what happened was they what they ignored practically they ignored every sign all the way up to the end it differed from the wicker man in that by the end in the wicker man, the poor man had a Luciferian moment. He realized that he was the sacrifice in the wicker man. So there is that moment where he sees, they, they bring him over the edge of the cliff and he sees the wicker man there. Oh, Jesus, no. They never got had that Luciferian moment in this film. Right at the end, they didn't know what it was. In the ninth gate, the one time in the ninth gate that I felt pity for Boris Balkan was at his very end when he started roaring. Um, as he was, he realised that the whole thing was a hoax and that he was the sucker. I felt pity for Balkan, genuinely. I pitied the man. Whereas I, I had, I, in, in The Wicker Man, I pitied the poor animals who were being burnt in the sacrifice. I thought that was very wrong. I did not pity Sergeant Howie in The Wicker Man, and I pitied none of them in this film, in The, the Borderlands. And that, fact, and that factor was brought into this film as well, that awful murder of the sheep outside the house they were staying in yes. by the local scumbags. Yes. Yes, yes. And were they scumbags or were they sending these men a very crude scumbaggy type warning? There was a failure on the part of these men to read the warnings that they were being sent all the time. They were getting these warnings that what they, those boys did to that sheep was unforgivable. But at the same time, as unforgivable as it was, it happened. And they didn't say, well, this is hold on. Are they sending us some kind of a fucking message here? You know, none of the messages was picked up on. And what I noticed with Deacon, Deacon, in my opinion, was a psychopath, a, a, a proper psychopath. When Father Krellick committed suicide, Deacon is talking to Gray about what has happened. And he said, you know, the souls of the damned, he committed a mortal sin. And when somebody commits a mortal sin, their soul descends into hell. And if you look at Gordon Kennedy played it brilliantly. Gordon Kennedy aced the, the part. Fabulous. Kennedy smirks. There's a smirk when he says that. 
They just, oh, they descend. Oh, he's practically going, oh, ha, 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 they descend into hell. I'm exaggerating it there slightly. But he, I got the smirk in Kennedy's face when he said that. Oh, I said, you scumbag. I said, that poor man killed himself. And you yeah. can't even at his last, yeah, you can't at his last moment show a degree of sympathy for a man who was, uh, yeah. And meanwhile, uh, Gray, the secular techie, who not a Catholic, is absolutely traumatized and upset and deeply, you know, deeply and profoundly hurt by Father Quellick's suicide. Yeah, if he was sufficiently, he'd got the fuck away. Absolutely, absolutely. But that was an he'd interesting dichotomy. That the one who wasn't religious was the one more likely to have the spiritual mindset. Oh, totally. I mean, both of those men, Father Amadon and Brother Deacon, had soul loss. They were, you know, this is, a, I mean, there's so many different things in this film. There's the issue of soul loss. These two men are priests, or well, Deacon's a brother, Amadon is a priest. And Amadon really reminded me of myself. It was like looking, he just, Aidan McCardell aced the road. It was very well cast. And just that whole officious way that he had, you know. Da, 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 da. Yeah. But um, there was something else that struck me. Gray did something profane. When he signed up for that job, he claimed to be a member of the congregation. He claimed to be a practicing, believing Roman Catholic. But he only signed up for the job for the money. That yeah. was very wrong on his part because... I think Father Ahmed and Mark had the notion that a properly spiritual Catholic would be somewhat psychically firewalled yep. against what they might encounter there. And before, Gray was a yeah, and before we go to Sarah, I just want to interject. Gray was on the phone to obviously some big shot in the Vatican or somewhere, and half of me wondered if they were all being sacrificed by the guy on the other end of the phone to this entity to see if it was real or not. Sarah could be. I thought Grey was on the side. I want to bring Sarah in here, Christian. Yeah. Um, I thought Grey seemed the most open-minded of them all, and he was the only one who wasn't of any religious persuasion. But he did have a decent moral compass, which kind of got more apparent as the film went on, especially at the end when they discovered what was underneath the... Um, underneath the church and I, I can see him now he threw himself on his knees and he was oh my god I can't believe this this is this it's awful when they found the skeletons underneath the church and he was really um really really sort of empathic if you like and he was very very open-minded when they had discussions in the pub as well he was prepared to talk about the difference between how the brother um deacon is willing to worship and believe in something you can't see whereas the old pagans who lived in the village worship the moon and the sun and and yes. the stars you could actually see those things um so he was he was compare he was comparing the two the two different belief systems and he, he put that to deacon and said how come you can um believe in something that you can't see you put faith in something you can't see, and yet those people who put faith in something that's right in front of them, they're 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 wrong. There's something wrong with them. Yeah. Um, and it was at that point in the pub, which I didn't quite understand, that the people in the pub had overheard what they were talking about, and they threw them out of the pub when they were having this discussion between the difference between paganism and Christianity. The landlord said, "Out." You need to leave now. Yeah, and he said a good man died. Oh, by the way, this film in the United States is a different title. It's called Final Prayer, I believe. So if you live in North America, that's the title for the film, if you're looking for it online or whatever. Back to you, Christian. They were thrown out of the pub because the locals knew they were a pair of fucking Egypts. That's why. The locals knew they were a pair of fucking Egypts. And what the locals knew was that this was a psychically very turbulent and dangerous situation and that they did not need this pair coming in, mouthing out of themselves, not even... One of the things that angered me about them was if I was going to a country pub uh, in Ireland or England or wherever and I drank alcohol or that, I would make it my business to introduce myself to people and say, hello, it's please, I'm, I'm just visiting for the while. How are you all getting on? I'd sit at the bar and chat. This pair of NPCs didn't because they're too fucking NPC to even try to socialize. Sarah, I think you have a higher opinion of Grey than I do. 
Grey is a nerd. This is revenge of the nerds shit here. I, I wanted to... The reason why I rudely interrupted earlier was because, just to remind me of this thought, Grey was on the phone to his employer in the IT company who arranged the job for him. I don't believe Grey was on the phone to anybody clerical or to the Vatican. Grey, in my opinion, was on the phone to his employer saying, I don't want to take on a fucking job like this again. But... What happened and what all of those men have in common, let's take the four men, um, let's leave Father Krellick out of it. What they all have in common was that none of them had the intellectual savvy to go that extra inch, if you like, and say, this is a situation that is beyond me and I need to get out. The only thing that all of them had to do was go away. There was nothing more that they had to do. Go the fuck away. That was what the people in the pub were saying to them to do. Get out. You're not welcome here. You're in danger here. The people in the pub, it's a very pagan thing. The people in the pub were bringers of good. The people in the pub were not evil. Yes, Thomas is, I don't think you're fully agreeing with me, but the people in the pub... Oh, no, no, I, I, I'm quite neutral about them, actually. I'm quite neutral. In fact, yeah. no, I, 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 if they didn't have killed the sheep, I'd completely... I completely agree with you. The sheep also have spiritual connotations, the Lamb of God. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Don't forget, though, it was teenagers who killed the sheep in their own way. Or maybe it was, who, who knows? But, you know, they, they, whoever killed that sheep committed an act of horrific animal cruelty. But at the same time, that was a very potent message to those men that you're not welcome here. And, you know, why? The, the, it's the NPC thing. The NPC doesn't say, why am I not welcome here? Is there some bigger picture here beyond these local yokels? I mean, he even, Gray even referred to the man on the bike that they pulled into condescendingly. Gray had a condescending and narrow-minded attitude to this local person. You're not fucking wanted in the village, guys. And there's a reason why you're not fucking wanted in the village. And it's not a tourism reason or that. We know that you are prying into a matter up there you are meddling in a matter up there that is beyond you. Do you remember in The Wicker Man, the woman who owned the sweet shop said to Sergeant Howie, Sergeant Howie, you are meddling and you shouldn't be here. And she gave him his warning. And those people in that pub, particularly the second time, gave them their warning. Get the fuck out. All you have to do is not come. Go, leave. You know, and right to the very fucking end, the passageway opens and they go down into the pub. I know, I, but, they, they, guys... but in their defense and at defense in quotations, they were spellbound. Gray also made fun of the town when he went grocery shopping, uh, like portraying as a hick town and a, 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 a town full of inbreds who don't have any culture. So he gave that as well. When I was talking about Gray's fella on the phone, I was ultimately talking about the guy that contacted his boss. What you know from the Vatican who who got the job contracted through there, Sarah? Yeah. What what Sarah? Your turn. Um, I was sorry, I was on the train of thought with you two there. Um, I felt I I felt sorry for Gray. No, he wasn't a very nice man, but the image of him at the end when he threw himself on his knees and he wanted to get out of those tunnels, and he he was the the fear in his face. I just felt for him. That's all. That's just the. The human side of me, I just felt for him. And um, now when I'm looking back on the film, knowing how it ended, I kind of feel for him a little bit more than the other two because Father Deacon was already said to be responsible for the death of seven other priests, something right. to do with ayahuasca um, yeah, yeah. that had gone wrong. And then when Christian pointed out that when the young priest committed suicide at the church... He actually had a smirk on his face and he, he just said, oh, it was a mortal sin. He's going to go to hell like he was enjoying that. So it does make you think, yes, he could be some kind of um psychopath, if you like, who oh, yes. has, has no, um, no, no value on other people's lives. Mm -hmm. Ray, was, to... Ray was also a 14. He was actually the only one there. He got excited about the concept that it was supernatural. Remember, he brought along the analog mixer to sweep the mics to find out where the entity was. So he was the only one who was actually believing supernatural forces at work. But again, as Christians said, said that should have been the warning to get the hell out of there. 
Yeah, That's I mean, it, it, Gray would have been one of these kind of people on, you know, Channel 5. I hope it's now a ghost hunter's programme. We're going to go down Victoria Tunnel in Newcastle. Hey, up! is the ghost of Eileen here? Eileen, is your ghost here? You were bombed in Second World War. Gray Mary would be loves on Dick. That. Mary loves Dick. Mary loves Dick. <laughs> Grey would be of that whole mindset of going fucking ghost hunting and this kind of thing, yeah. where we'd be saying, stay the fuck out. Don't, you know, the good pagan, paganism isn't all about smoking joints at Glastonbury and saying, hey, I'm a pagan priest, shite like that. Paganism is about the fact that your morality is on your own. So that means there's no Messiah going to come and hold your hand, but there's also no objective evil. So I don't view that entity under the church, from my pagan point of view, as evil. Why? Because it kept sending them warnings to go away. You know, go away. When when Father Mark got punched in the head and started bleeding for no reason. I, I, something I meant to say, an observation I made about Father Mark in particular, but Deacon in his own kind of psychopathic. Deacon's a psychopath, in my opinion, and an NPC. Both of them were like people during the head cold who you would have all of the evidence put in front of them, but they would simply refuse to join the dots. And these were two men of the church, allegedly, who had absolutely no grasp of spirituality or the fact that there was something else or that there may be something else there. They were both, but particularly Father Mark, they were obsessive debunkers. Have we yeah. come across? Yeah. Have we come across the debunker before? Yeah. They were yeah. debunkers. Bonkers. And not only now, that, I, not only that, when I first saw the film, I thought they were calling him Father Amadon, which we know is the Irish word for moron. And yeah. being an Irish actor, and I thought that was a pun on Amadon. Then it was Amadon, I found it later on. But I thought, it was, is he called Father Amadon? You know, that Father Moron? Which you, maybe we don't know. Maybe that was put in there as a pun by Mark McCardle or whatever. But yeah, I mean, he was like a civil servant, you know, uh, no, we must, we must, we must go by the protocol, and the rules, this kind of thing. I think he was a conscientious man. Mark was. Mark tried to call the thing off, and said, "Okay, this is it. Pack up. We're going home." This was after the suicide, and then Deacon unilaterally behind his back gets Father Calvino to come, and Mark should have just said, "Father Calvino, let's go and have a drink and turn around and go home now," but Calvino. The problem with Calvino was that he was genial. He was a he, he was a nice guy, Calvino. He was a like genuinely a likable guy, and it was very well portrayed and very authentic. Father Calvino was, um, but at the same time, he failed because he performed a ritual in a pagan context in which he said he was going to banish the demon. And that's a I'm very nervous. that's a very important part of the film. Oh. He actually brings it to life, Sarah. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I thought when Calvino was doing his exorcism in the church and he was reading the Latin mass or saying the Latin words, I thought that the um, thing underground had recognised those sounds yeah. as being from when the um, Roman em Empire came along and destroyed all the pagan altars and put the churches on stop. And by doing that, thereby stopped its food supply because there were no more pagans, country people to to feed it through through human sacrifice because the church was then put on top and it, it went back to sleep for several hundred years. Yeah, and that's what ties in with something and frozen shit. That ties in with something that... I've wondered about for many years, and you just probably solved it for me there, Sarah. These kinds of churches with those kinds of energies, I that you feel like there's something underneath them. I only come across them in England and Wales. I never come across them in Ireland. I can't, I'm not aware of one Irish church like that. And you've just solved it for me. The Roman Empire, the Romans were there. And I think that plays a huge part in that they were probably venerated by Romans as well as Brit 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 Britonic pagans. So that's a very interesting point. Now you put me on a whole other world of speculation. In general, though, Christian, you did think it was an excellent film, right? I thought it was outstanding. I thought it was one of the most frightening films I've ever seen. Um, it, it, it's exactly what Sarah said. You know, it leaves you, it leaves you crook afterwards, doesn't it? And, 
you know, I actually have to confess when I was watching it this time, I wasn't able to watch beyond when they descended into the, I'm confessing this to you and to all the people at home. I didn't watch it after they descended into the passageway near the end because I just, yeah. it was late at night and I just hadn't the stomach for it. I'm afraid guys, you know, um, and yeah, I just want to carry on with something. We don't know what happened in Brazil. I believe that what happened in Brazil was much more similar to what happened here and that those priests who died in Brazil were consumed by an entity there as well and that a cover up was done. Um, I'd like you to think about what I've said there. You may or may not agree with me, but that the, the story that the Vatican was sticking with for Brazil was a much more convenient story for them than accepting the fact that they were devoured by a pagan entity. I believe that something very similar happened in Brazil. Maybe it's just my whole way of thinking, and you may disagree with me, and I would accept that. Um, there was something else that I noticed. I just made a trivial, or rather a detailed observation. Do you remember when they started the observation in the church, the three men? Gray had a torch, and he jumped out at Deacon, like that. Yeah. I thought that that was the point at which had I been Father Mark, I'd have sacked Gray. Because if you are dealing with psychic things, then you need to take it seriously. That's not to be uh, reverential necessarily, but messing around like that destroys the psychic energy. And I believe that when the entity after that point was sending warning messages to them, that they were unable then to actually dis differentiate between corrupted data, to borrow a techie term, and what were genuine warnings. And I think Gray was responsible for that. I was That made me dislike, what Gray did that torch made me dislike him. And I was not able to shake my dislike for Gray subsequent to that. So I kind of just said, I wanted to throw down a Rennie to the thing when it was devouring him. You know, the, go for it, you know. The, uh, nice the, and quickly. The, the use of the sound I thought was particularly effective. That's that droning, humming sound when the entity was at present. That was that's as terrifying as the final scene. Sarah, what, what did you think about the actual aesthetic of the film, the sound and the look and things like that? It was really creepy and disturbing, and it the fact that it was so quiet and so ordinary just gave it another layer of um, chillingness. Everybody, the, the, they were just ordinary people who'd gone there to do a job, albeit they'd gone about it in the wrong way. The village, the villagers were there. They were there minding their own business. They didn't want outsiders in. I'm assuming that those villagers didn't really venture outside either. And it was all just very quiet. And, um, and then when you had what looked like poltergeist activity, and you had the noises, the vibrations coming through the church. That was very, very odd sounding as well. And it, it made the film made you think it was something demonic that we were dealing with through through the noises. Um, and Christian mentioned there about it being a pagan entity. Now, I thought to myself, perhaps this is some kind of um, cosmic creature that landed here. That's what I felt as well, out. very Lovecraftian, yep. The sigil yeah. looked like something from a spaceship or something. Did you notice that? It had a science fiction -y kind of look to it, the sigil that summoned it. Yeah, I I even, even beyond that, I thought maybe it's landed here, like, for example, how people believe the octopus landed here from an expulsion of something. Yeah. And there could have been thousands of them that landed here millions of years ago, and some have survived. And oh, are under the ground, and had, the pagans who were worshipping then thought it was a deity. Yeah, it had yeah. that Lovecraftian motif we see on the rats on the wall and the haunter in the dark. The deeper you go down, the more profound the truths become. Like what Christian was saying, they they exposed themselves as bigger and bigger idiots the more they went down. We've got yeah. four minutes left. I'll leave the mic open to you, Christian, to add okay. the next four minutes. Um, Thank you. One of the things that I noticed also was the dog. The dog attacked Gray and vanished. And then later on, Deacon, who Deacon by that stage later on had become quite obsessed with the church and he'd become obsessed with everything. And he went back and he he saw these images of Father Krellick, 
yet he seemed to have forgotten that Father Krellick topped himself off the fucking parapet earlier that day, you fucking idiot. So if he sees an image of Father Krellick, surely he should not chase it. He then comes across the surplus full of worms. I believe that the surplus full of worms and the dog earlier were shape-shifting manifestations of the entity. I believe that that is quite, they were the entity shape-shifting itself into a carnate form that was trying desperately to warn them not to come. This is why I refuse to see that entity as evil. The entity was not evil. My pagan theology says there's no such thing as objective evil. You know, you get the warnings put out in front of you there and it's up to you to either read the warning or not read the warning. And and they didn't do so. I mean, big, it's a fabulous big, film. Big things eaten, little things, just like Ray said, it's not personal. You know, it's a, did you see when the headstone shapeshifted? No. At one point, did, wait, I got this over to you two guys. Look back. Gray is out looking on his phone and there's a headstone that says Grace Parker. She died before her time, 1893. He looks away and the writing shifts to Gray Parker. He died before his time, 2013. Wow, I missed that one. Look, I got that. I When I saw that, I just had to... It was underpants change time, I'm afraid. It was just... I. If you know, I, I, do, you'd see that one. The headstone shape shifted. Well, that's why we brought you on for this. Uh, in the in the next minute, give us a quick wrap up, uh, Christian, before we we go to the books. Well, it was terrifying. It was a great film. The only setback, and it is the reason why I give it a nine out of ten rather than a ten out of ten, is because you have to watch it twice. Um, I found watching it twice was a very different, the second watching of it was a very different experience from the first watching of it. You know, um, I think it was one of the most pagan moralistic films, even more even than The Wicker Man, which moved me very much. You know, The Wicker Man and uh, this film moved me really to kind of the edge of my moustache, shall we say. But at the same time, uh, this was a very, very moral film. And um you know the warnings are put out for you there yeah it's up to you to read them and that's the pagan thing you know if you don't read them that's up to you that's your problem well thank you for that christian um uh, quick wrap up sarah I, I agree with, with Christian. It didn't seem to be a thing that got its kicks from teasing humans. It was more of a shark mentality where it eats when it's hungry. So it seems evil to us, but to the entity, it was just lunch. It didn't need a host like a parasite. It needed a keeper who'd feed it. And humans have always needed something to worship. And so I think the pagans of the ancient times who discovered this thing, venerated it into a pagan god and offered it sacrifices so it was feeding really well until Christianity arrived and drove out the old beliefs and built churches over the altars. Thank and... you, Sarah. Thank you, Christian. We'll definitely have you back on again. Yeah. It's been great. Bye -bye. And Bye -bye. Uh, The Borderlands Final Prayer in America, uh, one of the best films we've reviewed so far. And uh, go see it. If you haven't okay. seen it, get yourself a new pair of underpants. <laughs> And now, here is Sarah with a psychic hygiene. This week, I want to bring artistic expression into psychic hygiene. Many people shy away from art and creativity, believing they're not skilled enough or fearing the opinions of others including their own harsh self-critic. But the truth is, creativity is your authentic self speaking in its unique language. It might feel a bit unfamiliar at first, but that's just like a muscle warming up before its strength is reached without any strain. And art and creativity is a bridge between your inner and physical worlds. So think about writing thoughts in a journal, 
picking up paintbrushes and playing with paints on a blank canvas without any set plan, just feeling the paint and watching the paper come alive. And remember, it doesn't need to be a masterpiece. The goal is to simply enjoy the process. You could take photos of mundane objects and transform them into something beautiful by playing with lighting or angles and even letting your creativity run wild using tools like Photoshop. Create a feast using regular pantry items or transform a patch of land into a garden that will bring you joy through flowers, fruits and veggies in due time. If you're skilled in a particular art or craft form, then consider stepping out of your comfort zone with an artistic pursuit that you've never tried before. This unfamiliarity can peel back layers like an onion that you didn't even know existed and reveal hidden parts of yourself. But remember, whatever artistic mode you choose, enjoy the journey and avoid rushing to get it finished. Give yourself some free time to break from the usual routine and reconnect with your childlike self through your chosen art. And don't be swayed by those who might dismiss artistic pursuits as frivolous or valueless. They couldn't be more mistaken because creative expression is about infusing joy and revitalizing your spirit. So when doubt creeps in, acknowledge it, but don't give in to it. Keep in mind that good art isn't the main goal and that authenticity trumps perfection. Any art you create is a path to your inner connection and understanding. And that in itself is an act of psychic hygiene. Great stuff, Sarah. You got me thinking there about the stream of consciousness within the in literature, within writing, where you basically just let let feelings and things come out of you and ideas and just let it roll and see where it takes you. Very similar to jamming and music. Let's see where we go. Let's see where this goes. The same thing, it appears in lots, it can happen in lots of different things. If And you mentioned there about Photoshop, but you know, it's also a great one too. Collage, getting pictures from uh, magazines and comics and all kinds of letters and words from over the years. Do it. They're like the cut, like a visual version of uh, William Burroughs' cut ups and uh, David Bowie's cut ups, and arranging the images until something forms inside them that sits with you. And you will often find that not only is it a great creative tool for developing ideas, and also uh, developing your confidence in a visual sense, but you'll often find it has prophetic qualities as well. That it will can it can make you. In fact, I know it does. It can actually move from your subconscious onto the onto the onto the uh, the paper, and then you'll really start to think, like you said, why instead of saying it's not perfect, why of all the pictures in the world did I pick that one? Why did I put it there? Why did these letters appear? And that's a really powerful thing because not only are you like what you're describing, creating for the joy of creativity, but also you're unleashing things that may be within your subconscious mind or in the zeitgeist at the collective unconscious level that you bring forward. So I heartily endorse this, uh, this psychic hygiene thing. And it ties in perfectly what I've been thinking in the last say, 24 hours or so. So thank you, Sarah. Nestled in the middle of the Irish Sea is the independent nation of the Isle of Man. Named after the Irish sea god, McManaman MacLear, the island is a place of many mysteries and rich and timeless folklore. Every valley, 
hedgerow, old stone and crossroads, gentle flowing brook and forest seems to contain a plethora of experiences and archetypes leading us back to the ancient past. The island's culture being a hybrid of Gaelic and Norse is a place where the goblins of Scandinavia and the she fairies of Ireland live side by side among rugged rolling hills and windswept coastlines. The Manx population of the island are never far from their ancient ancestors and their powerful spiritual and cultural heritage going back thousands of years. For myself personally, the Isle of Man is a powerful touchstone which helps to unravel that incredibly mysterious rollover period between paganism and the arrival of Christianity. And part of this powerful touchstone are the Manx Crosses, which are considered one of the greatest legacies of the early Christian faith and Viking settlement, as well as part of the conversion of the Isle of Man towards the Abrahamic fate. Numbering over 200, they range from grave markers, memorials and altar fronts, and they are nearly all mostly carved in local stone. The decorations range from simple incised crosses to complex interlaced patterns and gripping beast motifs with depictions of Christian and Scandinavian themes and this is where the story gets interesting as it is almost impossible to distinguish if these crosses were pagan or Christian in origin. While they have played a major role in the conversion of the Manx inhabitants to Christianity, they are far too resplendent in pagan gods and archetypes to be considered purely Christian alone. A large number of these are marked with inscriptions using Irish Om, Roman and Runic scripts, uh, giving tribute to the surrounding kingdoms nearby of England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales as well as to far off Scandinavia where their Viking ancestry originated from. The carved stone crosses of the Isle of Man show many familiar Viking heroes, gods and goddesses such as Sigurd, the dragon slayer who slew Fanir, in a story owing its origins to the Icelandic tales called the Volsunga Saga. Also, there are images of Loki, Odin, Hemdal, who is famously known for sounding a horn called the Galjahorn, while keeping watch for invaders and the onset of Ragnarok, as well as many other pagan elements which festoon these so-called Christian Manx crosses, and which understandably leave one wondering if these artifacts are even Christian at all and that paganism, both Norse and Celtic paganism, survived on the Isle of Man far longer than we are being officially told. Considering that many of these crosses come from a period from before the common usage of the crucifix within Christianity itself, does this also lead us to the conclusion that the carved stones were never Christian to begin with and were simply later co-opted when the tide of history allowed it to happen? <laughs> D. 
the anomaly of the Manx Cross speaks to the very heart of this mysterious Isle of Nation itself. Almost as if the small nation with its ancient stones, churches and landscapes saturated in folklore and mythology exists as a place to defy the official historical record and remains in the service of the old gods. This is Thomas Sheridan reporting for Hocus Focus from the Isle of Man. switch over to Thomas to get any insights from his psychic weather barometer for this week's Week in Psychic Weather. Well, the week in psychic weather this week, it should really be the weekend because that's when things have picked up in the last three days. It's more of a synchronistic one and a symbolic one. Pluto, the planet Pluto and things to do with Pluto are appearing everywhere. Uh, people I know who don't know each other, uh, out of the blue had mentioned that they're reading books on Pluto and, and one a friend of mine even suggested a book on Pluto that I had just purchased myself. And all over my news feeds, the pictures of the planet Pluto taken from the New Horizons spaceship, when they discovered that contrary to being an, an ice world that was snow white, that it had a, an interesting surface and looked a lot like a proper planet. And we all know that you, that Lovecraft said that the planet would be called Ugot and existed just beyond Neptune. Well, they knew there was a planet out there because of the orbital anomalies in the outer planets. They knew there was something there. Neptune, is, Pluto is very small. In symbolism, well, there's lots of things, I guess. Now, I don't know a lot about astrology, but I know in symbolism, Pluto is the purger, the god of the underworld. Pluto is great for starting new projects, uh, seeing things differently and moving in different ways. Pluto is... When they talk with the God of the Underworld, it really means subconscious. It's not particularly negative. It's not the devil. But also an interesting synchronicity, too, is that the latest version of the hoofing cough is called Eris. And Eris is a Greek goddess, but it's also the name of the tenth planet beyond Pluto that many people know. Well, again, they, it has to exist because anomalies in Pluto's orbit. There's another planet out there, way, way out there. and so that's interesting, too, that they've named the latest variant after the planet, but and a, the, basically the twin of Pluto that's out further. So Pluto is everywhere, not the dog, the planet. And keep an eye on this one, because I have a feeling this is really significant, big time. And that's me, Thomas, with the psychic weather. That may tie in nicely to something in the Tarot of the Week later on in the show, and that's all I'm going to say. Our next supernatural topic tonight is one that pays us a visit during our sleeping hours, and that is the Night Hag, which is a supernatural creature that paralyzes a sleeping person. And upon waking, people describe the feeling of an entity sitting on the chest or at the foot of the bed. And there have been many medical and scientific professionals who relate this sensation to sleep paralysis. And other people just think it's a bad dream. And then there's other people, again, who believe it's something entirely more sinister than that. 
And in some cultures, it's actually believed that the hag is a demon which can be summoned by the black magic of someone hurt or the actions of a jealous person. And not only that, it's also thought to be a punishment for somebody who has wronged another and have been terrified by their own reflection in a slumber. Have you ever encountered the night hag, Thomas? No, but I had a nan, God love her, she's dead now, whose life was ruined by it. Uh, she had it all her life and literally was terrified of sleep. And I didn't really know much about it because my mother was telling me that your Aunt Eileen, she wakes up in the middle of the night paralyzed and this old woman is lying on top of her and with a horrible face staring at her. And uh, so I never really spoke to her about it until one night I was sitting at home. I was actually, it was in my parents' house actually, it was on my own early 2000s and channel four had a documentary called the entity on that was all about the night hag including dramatized reenactments of what it was like and it's honestly one of the most terrifying documentaries i've ever seen it's on youtube if you want to check it out the night hag the entity night hat documentary now the documentary was interviewing people as lives had been basically destroyed by it but it also was interviewing psychologists and you had neuroscientists on talking about it and saying things like, um, well, it's a trick. You see, what happens is a trick the mind plays during your in a, you're in a, during sleep, you go into a kind of a state that stops you from doing self harm if you dream. So it basically shuts off your, your muscles and it shuts off your nervous system. And that's where the paralysis comes from. It's deliberately done during dreaming to stop you from doing self harm, which is fascinating by itself anyway. But this, night hag thing was more than that and even they finished up by saying we really don't know what it is but didn't go quite admit that maybe it is something supernatural now the night hag has been reported for centuries thousands of years actually roman times it was even reported and there's even i think there were laotian people who emigrated to the united states and they have their they have their own name for the night hag and large numbers of the men in that immigrant group died. They'd be a perfectly healthy young men would be found dead in their beds the next morning. And these would be men who had previously been reporting night hack experiences, their version of it. So it was actually killing them. That makes you wonder too about all the, the suddenly and unexpectancies about perfectly healthy people coming in, the parents or their family members find them dead in bed the next morning. And they of unknown causes, and you wonder if the needle craft is not turned down their psychic wall or something like that to allow these things in. But the did the whole thing. I wouldn't want to see it. I couldn't imagine any. I've never had any. I never had sleep paralysis experience, and it's one thing I definitely wouldn't want to go through. Is the night hag experience? There's also it, but there's also that famous painting by the Swiss artist Fuseli called the dream that shows a woman lying with a monkey on her chest i have had that experience i've had that thing attack me when i was about 17 and, and jump on my back and beat me the kind of like monkey ape thing but that's very different than the night hag the, 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 the paranormal changes over decades and centuries and if you go back into old magazines paranormal and 40 magazines Back in the 60s and 70s, no mention of Night Hag at all. But we know now that there was reported in in uh, Roman times and in other groups, just maybe just wasn't reported. Maybe just people just thought it was a nightmare or embarrassed or afraid to come forward. But do you know anyone? I had a nan, like I said, I had my aunt Eileen, God look, rest her soul. She had it. But do you know anybody that had it? Uh, yes, I, I know we've got a, a member of my family um, has had an experience with it. I've never had an experience with it, but I have had sleep paralysis. Usually if I lie in a certain position um, and then I wake up, my eyes open, I can't move and I can't breathe for what feels like forever, but I know it's not. And then all of a sudden it, you gasp <clears throat> and then everything comes back and that's frightening enough. So I can't imagine how frightening it is to see a monkey or a hag sat on your chest as well, but I've never seen anything. Yeah, within psychology, it's called intruder experience. And it isn't always the night hag. 
it's sometimes people don't even see anything. They have the sleep paralysis episode and they don't, they look open their eyes and look around and they don't see anything, but they have a tremendous experience that something is there in the room with them. They sense an, an entity in the room with them, but they don't actually see it. Others see a shape in the doorway, the shadow people, and the most common one, the, the one that they seem that seems that archetype seems to change through time as well. Sometimes it's kind of like a bulbous shadow, other times a very defined shadow man shape. And now you have the hat man thing that looks like the the, the man on the Sandman port bottle with the, the white hat. Now that one really fascinates me. The, the hat man thing. And sometimes he appears with a top hat as well. And I often wonder what that one is about. It's almost like a stage magician or something. I've, I've had a shadow person. I've seen one shadow person. He wasn't the hat man. He looked like the Grim Reaper. But he was solid black. He was solid black and he was as tall as the wardrobe. And he was stood right there and he was lent with his arm, the crook of his arm was the was his staff or whatever it's called. The thingy it wasn't it's a side. side. It, it was like a um a shepherd's hook. This okay, thing. It wasn't yeah, a side. Yeah, a crook. That was the, is it a crook? Well, it, that was in the crook of his arm, and he was lent on it, and the cowl was right over, and he was looking not at me, but um across the other side of the room, and he. It was there, and I woke up, and I'm thinking, I'm awake, I'm awake. It's there. It's not dis- It's not dissipating. It's still there. Please don't turn around. Please don't look at me, because I thought if he looked at me, I might see the glowing eyes, which would have finished me off. But he didn't. He was still there, and it was about 30 seconds in this, and I thought, this bugger's not moving. He's not moving. And that's when the shock kicked in, and I just went hysterical. And as I banged the light on, um, it, then it just disappeared. That sounds like the ring rates from uh, Lord of the Rings. They were kind of Grim Reaper, monkish looking with cloaks and hoods. They had that look about them. Yeah. He was solid. He was solid. Nobody, um, it wasn't an harbinger of death or anything because that's what first was in my mind. But there, there wasn't any, nothing, it, came and it went and nothing nothing untoward happened haven't seen it since it was about 2016 but where I saw it I walk past that area now and I have to look at it and I feel like that might be a portal or a way in and out from one realm to another and I am I smudge it a lot around that area as well but I've not seen anything there since that might be my paranoia H.P. Lovecraft, when he was a boy, was tormented by things he called the night guns, that they were these demonic entities that pulled and ripped at his stomach during sleep paralysis episodes. And when he grew up, he saw an illustration by the artist Dory, you know, these famous illustrations of these kind of winged humanoid creatures. And he said, that's exactly what they looked like. Now, he believed that these things were could have been real, even though he was an atheist. He said these things may well have been real, you know, not as. And uh, he often wondered if they were the ones who opened his mind up to his mythos, and he channeled all the other ones like, you know, Cthulhu and Azathoth and all the others through his mind because of these night guns to the point where he called them. The, the, the nocturnal phas- ph- phantasms of my slumbers, he was actually in letters towards the end of his life wondering, am I really a creative writer or am I actually seeing these entities and I'm writing about them because I'm able to perceive them in the dream world? And then what kind of a writer am I? I'm not being imaginative. I'm actually just reporting something that exists. Very, very interesting letters. So, you know, uh, uh, Lovecraft, Without actually, say, his mother was also she, before she went to put her in Butler Hospital in Providence. She was chased around the streets of uh, Providence by a giant monster that looked like a giant insect, and it chased her around Providence to the point where she collapsed in in a state and ended up in Butler Hospital and uh, died in the hospital. The 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 hospital, and a lot of 
and you know a lot of madness ran in his family you know his father probably died of syphilis syphilitic issues maybe we don't know but he, it's a lot of what Lovecraft's life was to try and find a way not to end up in Butler Hospital, which I've actually been to the grounds of. And um, the uh, even staff that work in Butler the Hospital today have been ordered not to talk to anybody who wants to know about Lovecraft's mother and the experience that she had in Providence. Now, that's I think that's really interesting. That is terrifying, that, uh, or for a number of reasons, um, not least because that would make Cthulhu real. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, that, and... was, that all came to me during the lockdowns and during the, the whole Rona days that it, Lovecraft never specified just what size the outer gods were. And it was this bizarre virus, one of the outer gods. When I was younger, I used to have dreams about, um, this is before I knew who Lovecraft was, I was quite younger, I used to have dreams about black tentacles coming out of thunderstorm clouds and sweeping along the rolling hills. Yeah, and it's also in that same period that all this consciousness regarding octopuses and them being cosmic creatures have all come to the fore in recent times, not to mention Pluto is back in the thing again. Lovecraft actually wondered if he had actually created Pluto from his imagination because he'd written a story calling it Yugoth, where this these these this fungus called the Migo came from. And I know half of me wonders, now you hear stories like Anuma Uma, if that was what brought the the world that we live in now, the post-2020 world. But there's also the possibility, and I did a broadcast on Thorn when it happened. I think it was 2017 or 16, maybe, when the New Horizons spacecraft visited Pluto and showed it was a very different place than what anybody expected it to look like. More like a real planet than just a frozen ball of ice. So you do wonder, yeah, I mean, that, that you know, his, his mother seeing these entities and chasing her around the streets, that she had a breakdown, was brought to the hospital, him dreaming them. Yeah, like he actually... A lot of you know he he definitely was an occultist because he had access to his his grandfather's Withels library and he was one of the top Freemasons in New England and he had an enormous esoteric library and he was a boy spent Lovecraft spent you know many many years growing up in the in the the, the Whittle Phillips library and you do you know he, he it was almost like he was finding a defense against these things. But yeah, he had those dreams all his, you know, for all his true shot of the, the night cons. And then he believed that all the other entities were all... Com well, if you look at the Call of Cthulhu, it contacts the world through dreams. And you remember in the early days of the the lockdowns, that everyone, what are you dreaming? They were interested in their dreamings, interested in what we were seeing. And that's how the Call of Cthulhu starts off. Uh, uh, you know, an art student falls into melancholy and produces what they call the horror in clay, the bas relief. And then it turns out there's newspaper reports that have been collected of like strange events in the West of Ireland or in the Philippines or in the Southern States of America. And, you know, it just it, it got, I mean, that I don't think I would have been able to deal with the, the whole lockdown thing the, uh, the way I could if I hadn't had that spiritual, supernatural thing to call upon. Uh, because more and more every day when that was going on, I felt like, even as you used to say it, I feel like I'm living in a Lovecraft story. The way people change and everything. Maybe with Lovecraft's family, maybe it wasn't insanity or madness. Maybe it was channeling and they were a chosen family. And for that reason, they chose that family knowing that he had the ability to write and get the stories out there. And then that would have a profound impact on people like yourself who and other people um, who wouldn't fall for what was coming along down the line now. And it would kind of help to sort out the weak from the chaff, the weak from the strong, the creative people from the NPCs. Yeah, absolutely. And um, 
Lovecraft's family came from Devon in England, which is Celtic Britain, named after the Celtic tribe, the Devonians. And as a little boy, she did what mothers in Celtic countries used to traditionally do, dress them as little girls. And the first photographs of him, he's dressed in a petticoat with his hair done up like a little girl. And that's what was Oscar Wilde's first photograph. And people nowadays say, oh, that was the first, like, kind of, you know, transgender. It wasn't. They used to dress, dress the little boys up in the Celtic world so they wouldn't be abducted by the fairies because the fairies were after little boys. And I'm wondering, too, if his mother had brought that on from horse, the Philip side of the family from Devon, had brought that over to America, that the boys in the family are... I mean, he was the only boy. He didn't have any brothers he knew about. So the boys in the family were targets for the fairies, and then she dressed them up in the little girl's outfit for that reason, too. Yeah, makes you think it does. And it makes you think if that mythos with those creatures um, is right here, right next to us, but we can't see it, just like they were in the film, the was it The Mist or The Fog that we reviewed? The I Mist. Both. So, the Mist. And um, the, gov the military operation blew a hole in the fabric and yeah. they were all coming in, but they were always right next to us. We just didn't know. No, oh, absolutely. I, 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 that's 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 what I think. Like you know, the within his stories, like in the the the, the shadow over Innsmouth, the esoteric order of Dagon, where the old. This is an interesting one because you know his grandfather Whittle Phillips was a massive uh, Freemason, and in the 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 shadow over Innsmouth, the Freemasonic lodge falls into decay in the town and is replaced by something called uh, the esoteric order of Dagon, which worships Mother Hydra and Father Dagon. Now, even that is interesting. Like, that is almost like he was saying, well, the Freemasonic world is over and we're in this new reality now. Even that, and you did see how people did worship the, the Rona as a god. We saw that. It became a god. And its image, that image of the actual virus itself appearing all over the internet and all over mass media, it looked like an entity of some kind. You know, the blue thing with it, it all it needed to have these suckers coming out of it. I mean, it was as love crafting as anything, you know? And it held the I entire think, planet in its mercy. I think if that's the case, then these things certainly have a type a type of person that they feed off and perhaps that information that Lovecraft channeled and put in his books was the antidote that would be the deciding factor of whether you were going to be um, Cthulhu food down the line. And what was the antidote that he was ultimately telling us to accept it and not be afraid of it? Because in all the stories, none of his protagonists are actually killed by the entities. They kill themselves. They either go mad or they commit suicide uh, because they are confronted with this thing that they have to put into the Abrahamic belief of good and evil. And that's why I felt like that if you would, I mean, I, tr I tried to bring this up at Providence, at Necronomicon and Providence, and I got a, a sea of blank faces. But I said, if you approach the Cthulhu mythos, from a pagan or a Hindu point of view, where you have multiple gods, the whole concept of good and evil vanishes and they become natural forces of the universe. And you're less likely to be tormented into death or suicide by the, the sight of one. So that was the, that was the antidote. The antidote was to lose the fear because it would be the fear that would destroy you. It's like what you always say about these, these creatures, these entities, it's the same thing. They're just living their own lives and doing their own business. They're not good or bad. They're doing their entity stuff without a sense of uh, it's only the Abrahamic thing of good and evil and evil spirits that makes us think they're evil and dangerous. In reality, it's not. they have nothing personal against us. Just stay out of the way. Like yeah. when, what, at the beginning of the Rona time, when we said a spiritual force is sweeping across this planet, you just get out of the way. Don't try and fight it. Don't try and um, stop it. Just get out of the way and, 
And that was that was one of the good things about them making you stay at home because you could get out of the way and let the madness just sweep through and not stay at home because you was afraid to leave the house, but just because you knew you don't get in the way of a spiritual force because it'll just eat you alive. Yeah. I mean, not even personal, it'll just do it. And that shows up in quite a few of the stories, like the haunter in the dark, uh, the Catholic church on top of the hill on top of Federal Hill that he sees through the telescope and goes to investigate and find, meets the, the Irish copper who's like basically telling him to stay out. Don't go near. Don't go. go don't go in there. Just leave it be and you'll live a happy life. Don't dive into their domain. And that also seems to happen to the other Irish copper in the heart Red Hook, Thomas Malone, who goes nuts when he becomes very emotionally damaged by the fact that he's actually encountered this thing. He never recovers, even though, you know, he's a university educated man and a hard nosed New York detective. It's the actual encounter with the thing that messed him up. And that, it, that's, that seems to be over and over again the same thing, is that don't encroach on their domain and you'll be fine. I think it's the people with the heavily religious backgrounds, especially the Abrahamics, that suffer the most because it shatters their um, perception on life, their whole belief system. Just crumbles and, and this the is atheist. good and evil, and it's there isn't. And the atheists too, because they yeah, don't. And the, yeah, yeah, because it's, they don't believe in this stuff, and then they're confronted by it. They're confronted by these things that they shouldn't exist, and they go mad. You know, they go. I mean, there's a there's a very high rate of suicide among atheists, which doesn't really make a lot of sense. You know, but they have an extraordinary, and a lot of them are also very interested in ontology as well, but, but they. They, there was one chap in England who was like a, a hardcore communist and atheist who was one of the big uh, ontological guys in Britain about 10 years ago, killed himself out of the blue and a young guy with wife and kids. So it's almost like when they, they, they condition themselves to believe there's nothing and then they wake up at, you know, at 3 a.m. in the morning and what they believe have convinced themselves doesn't exist is staring them right in the face and they can't handle it. They can't handle it. That's the beauty about being into 40 and stuff and the paranormal and the unexplained. It kind of prepares you because you've seen that much stuff anyway that you can't explain ghosts and um, spirit, will, will of the wisps and things like that. That yeah. When you are finally confronted with something major, you kind of got the, the tools up here psychologically yeah. to deal with it better. Every single person I know that got through the whole role of thing in a way the normies didn't, were all interested in the supernatural and paranormal. It gave them the toolkit because we, or even the hauntological thing. We, we spoke about this. Our, our book covers a lot of this. Their upcoming book, Hocus Focus, covers this a lot. We grew up watching Quatermass films. So when the real thing came along, we were ready for it. It's almost like Nigel Neal was a prophet, Lovecraft were a prophet. Terry Nation, who wrote some of the Doctor episodes, Doctor Who episodes, were prophets, Philip K. Dick, and on and on and on and on. They gave us, and also uh, Robert Anton Wilson, they get, and even uh, uh, Count the Sprague, which was one of Lovecraft's associates, friends, and writers, and also biographer, he actually wrote an essay back in the day and he said when 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 the cosmic horror beings come into reality it won't affect us because we've already known about them it won't be a great mystery and that's exactly that 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 does not completely sum it all up and that ties in with the ufo and the disclosure thing that's going on at the moment we're all knowing oh it's going to be fake it's all been made up it'll be project a project blue beam type thing it's fake but all the normies are believing and they're going nuts. You just wait. If they unleash that alien, fake alien, alien, alien stuff and they're and they're looking like they are in the next decade or so, when all the normies are going nuts, and maybe the Rona was the precursor of that, people like us will be going, we won't even, oh, it's, it's not real. It's a fake. Why? Because we did the homework. We did the homework by the kind of cultural paths we walk. This is why... I think uh, Greg Moffat's talk at the Mysterious Air Conference will be about, or will cover these kinds of things. You know, they're they're 
on, you have on one side the real paranormal stuff. You have Easter Island, you have the megaliths, you have the haunted houses, you have all that stuff. But on the other side, what do you have? You have the fictional things, the movies, the TV shows, the books, magazines, the comics. And they both belong together. You know, I'm still trying to fuse a mythos of some kind with the Irish Round Towers. I know it exists out there somewhere, but I will find it one day. And because, and will that dilute or ruin my interest or investigation around towers? No, it complements it in a in a cultural sense, just like it does the megaliths, just like it does anything really. The um, if the cosmic horror entities are real, then the religious people are going to fall down. The Christians are going to fall down straight away because all the crucifixes in the world aren't going to make the bl a blind bit of difference. Yeah. All the new ages are going to fall down straight away because all the love and light you send isn't going to make a blind bit of difference. And then you've got the Fortians who oh. know that these things are real and they're physical and they're there and they don't respond to love and light and they don't respond to crucifixes and religious paraphernalia. They respond to you getting out of their way and not getting involved it already happened uh, during the Rona. How did the clergies and the religious orders behave and treat their parishioners when the lockdowns happened? They, they hid behind their parochial houses in terror. They wouldn't even visit them for their last rites. They betrayed them. They showed their true nature when the, when the you know, the, the Cthulhu Corona showed up. Uh, the same with the, the New Age love and lighters, like you just said. I know so many of them who are all natural spirit. I'm not afraid of anything. Everlasting life, love and light. I'm a spiritual, I'm a, I'm a spiritual experience having a, I'm, in, I'm, I'm immortal. And they were the first ones to roll. Even someone who are anti-needlecraft crusaders were the first in a state of panic to roll their sleeves up saying, so, yeah, we've got the psychological tools to deal with anything that's coming, really, whether it's cosmic horror or whether it's um, um, something else. Fake aliens. And we also know from the the conspirator, conspiratorial side of our nature about things like Project Blue Beam and how they've done these things in the past. Like they projected a gigantic picture of the Virgin Mary above Havana to try and end communism. They've tried it already. They didn't have the kit and the gear. But now they do. They do have it. And then I, I have to tell you a story. I told someone this recently, but I don't know if I said it on, online, is that about 10 years ago here, at Knock Airport, just on the top of the mountain here, about 10 years ago, some guy said, some religious nuts, well, allegedly, said that the Virgin Mary would appear at the people if they were near the, on the mountain beside the airport, looking towards the Ox Mountains, which are here. And a, a lot of the old ladies and holy rollers went up there and they saw the Virgin Mary in the middle of the afternoon. And all, it was a big claim, like people say, the Madonna, because the Virgin Mary is supposed to appear at Nock. That's why it's, it's famous. It's a Marian shrine. And while I was hiking in the mountains in those days and something very peculiar happened, on top of one of the mountains, some military trucks went in and leveled off the top of the mountains and made it a flat base, as if they were installing some kind of machinery on it, projectors or something like that. And I, 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 this was only when I put two and two later. I was like, what the hell? I thought it was a mining company. And then I said, well, no, the army are up there testing new weapons. That was a guy in the pub told me. He said, the army trucks, they're testing, they're testing some radar or something. Now, they cleared the top of a mountain and flattened it. And uh, so we brought some serious equipment up. I think that they had brought up some kind of Project Blue Beam projectors and created that vision of the Virgin and tested it to see if they could actually, you know, have a test run if these if these technologies work. And I bet it's happened in other places too. I think they're doing it, or they're in the middle of doing a test run with something at the moment. I'm not sure how how much you can go into it without it getting censored. But um, the little green men in a Peruvian village. Oh, I saw moment, that, yeah. Terrorizing it. But I I think that the powers that be have purposely chosen a 
remote village full of a tribal villagers who don't watch TV and, and don't have a clue what bloody hell's going on in the rest of the world. So they're going to believe anything they see. Or it's like the uh, Virginia one in Brazil and it's the real thing. And the powers that be are capitalizing on it because they made a mistake in Brazil by getting all Roswelly about it and missed an opportunity. Maybe they said the next thing that happens will be there on the ground working with it to see what happens instead of getting all denial and chasing people away. So that's that's a, a, um, an even more frightening situation than um, it just being the powers that be trying to trick you, the fact that they might be working in cahoots with these things. Well, I've uh, there was a guy called Phil Schneider said that that there was tunnels under America where they this went on. Now, I never really believed them. And maybe he was spoofing, but maybe the actual underlying thing. We'll, we'll never forget that call on on Ark Bell on coast to coast, where the guy came on screaming one night. I heard that live. Do you know that famous call, where the guy goes, yes. "I'm not working," and, and, and the people don't understand. They're demons, and I gotta go. I gotta go. And it was then. Then a similar voice calls back a few weeks later, saying, "I was just a hoax." Now, why would you call to say it was a hoax if you coaxed people? Um, sorry, I upset people. I think that that first phone call was legit and real. And that guy had seen it. The, I, I will never, I was listening to it. I was at work, it was late at night, uh, about one, two in the morning when I was working the night shift. And the guy goes, and this was like long before this came out. They're not what people think they are. They're demons. And then they're going to, they're going to kill the whole world. They're planning to wipe out the population. 2020. So there you go, folks. If you want to add to this very Nightmare. nightmarish stuff. But again, like Sarah said, we have a toolkit. If you haven't heard that coast to coast call thing, I'm absolutely convinced it's real. I don't believe the one that calls back later and says it was just a joke. I didn't really mean to upset people. I am. Um, uh, we started off talking about Night Hag and ended up with this, but maybe. Maybe the night hag is working for DARPA. Just no matter how crazy it gets out there in the next few years, just keep your wits about you and uh, refer to your Fortean psychological toolkit. Yeah, we already have. All right. Yeah, we already have the psychic firewall. Excellent, excellent advice, Sarah. And now we come to the book section of the show, and for me, it's a bit different this week. What I'm going to show is not a book, but a periodical called Fate Magazine. Fate Magazine is like the 14 Times of America. It was published from the 1960s on. It's kind of legendary. These are copies from the late 60s and early 70s. It's in a Reader's Digest style. This book, this series of periodicals, if you can get your hands on them, they're great. One, two, lots of reasons. Firstly, the standard of writing is very, very good. It's a great one to read for inspiration and ideas. There's the things they cover are everything from the standard 40 and stuff, but they're all, they were always trying to look at it from a different angle. I just read one about a course regarding a train line on Ackle Island in Ireland that the, it was cursed by a witch and the course, the prophecy came true. It also it can, it can, it has stories to do with everything from, this would be the first time people hear about Gnosticism in the average person. Uh, Petra, the city in the desert, and so on. And they were always digging up new ways of looking on things. On top of that, it's full of wonderful advertisements in the back for psychics and all kinds of magic things. Like, it's, it's there's a beautiful innocence about it, too. And, I, you know, if I had have lived in America in the 60s and 70s, I would, have had a, I would have went mental for this magazine. It's so good. So don't only limit yourself to books also look at old periodicals of magazines in these genres that can help you and i highly recommend 1960s and 70s issues of fate you can get lots of them on ebay and it's not that expensive i think at the end of this show i might go grab myself a few online because those will be priceless for helping us um produce future shows with new ideas and things to talk about good and research they have books. That fabulous Old bookie smell. Yeah, I like that. I like that. 
Okay, I chose this week's book in light of last week's topic that resonated with many people who were watching. And my book is a host of voices, the Doris, a Doris Stokes collection. And this book actually contains two of the best-selling books, Voices in My Ear and More Voices in My Ear. And in the first section, it's very autobiographical. And she talks about how she discovered and developed the gift that she had. And she'd had a telegram informing her that um, her husband had been killed in the Second World War. And during her grief for that, she was visited by a dead father who told her that he was actually still alive and he would return home eventually. And her deceased father also told her about uh, the impending death of her healthy baby son. And both predictions actually came true. Now, in the second part, more voices in my ear, Doris recalls the time she helped a family of one of the Yorkshire Rippers victims, Jane MacDonald. And the family had reached out to Doris for a sitting. And during it, Doris made a connection with the 16-year-old daughter who'd been murdered by the Ripper. Now, without going into too much detail about it, Jane told Doris what had happened on that fateful night. The book does go into detail, but I don't want to. And along the way, she gave some information about the last words that she'd exchanged with her parents and some other private memories to show her parents that it was really her. And she gave the name John Sutcliffe, which later turned out to be part of the name of Peter John Sutcliffe. Wow. Doris also... Yeah, Doris also writes about the Ripper's infamous tape recordings and she makes some really odd references to how she thought something was off with them. But in the book, she passes it off as being because the man was, wasn't speaking naturally and he was reading a message or a script. But I think she knew and was trying to say without actually saying that somebody else was involved and we all know who. But back then, there was absolutely no way she could have put that in a published book or even been believed. And then so that part, the part of the book about Peter Sutcliffe is then written from a different perspective of her helping the victim's families rather than her helping the police inquiries. But what made me think it was odd was it shifted very suddenly from her helping the police to listening to the um, Ripper voice finding something suspicious about it and then the whole book then just goes in a different direction like she cut it short and didn't want to talk about that anymore so I think she knew something and it's a really good read and she was a very down-to-earth lady she was very typical of the time she lived in she liked to smoke and she came from a working class background and to me, she was the epitome of a lady with a beautiful gift that she used to help others and you'll laugh and you'll cry at some of the stories and the anecdotes that she recalls from her life, both on and off the screen. She's written it beautifully and respectfully. And for me, she's up there with Derek Akora, two beautiful, authentic souls. And there is this one here, which is volume one, which I've just reviewed. And we also have volume two here and volume three which follow on. And this last volume was written just before she died in 1986. So it really does cover all of her life. And it's a very, very interesting. That's incredible stuff about the Sutcliffe name. And also we're talking about the Wearside Pete uh, tape, the one that they terrorised every community in the north of England with. Yes. That tape, which we are both deeply suspicious about anyway, is that kind of ties in with that well that's a woman i never heard of and that's i haven't got time to read the three books but that's a fantastic uh book review sir because i think it just introduced us uh, me and a lot of people who would never heard of the lady into this into, i'm sure her books will sell like with a lot of people after your review oh I'll, I'll put the links to all three books in the description box and for anybody who's not aware of her she was a british medium um like Derek Cora, but back in the 70s and 80s. She was very, very famous, and she was always on the television. I have no memory of her, but then again, I probably I wasn't probably watching that back then or just didn't come into my consciousness. Fascinating. And so, now this is a part of the show called The Shameless Plug. If you haven't actually noticed already, Sarah is sporting the fabulous Hocus Focus T-shirt in black, is it? In black? And it's look, in black, yeah. Look at the quality of the logo. Look at that. 
This is a long sleeve t-shirt, a women, a woman's long sleeve t-shirt. This one. It's a nice fashionable, course. nice fashionable t-shirt too. It's very fitted. It's very nice shape. Yeah, yeah and, and and the the shoulders are almost lovely and straight. You know, for a t-shirt, they're, they're almost yeah, and and very classy sleeves. And it's very, very heavy cotton as well, so it's not going to go out of shape, which I was a bit concerned about at first when we first opened the shop. But yeah. um, it's a very heavy, heavy cotton, American cotton. And, of course, while we're shameless plugging, just put myself back in view, I've got a matching mug. There you go. Perfectly hocus focus coordinate. All you need is a baseball cap and you'd be complete. Hang on a second. I have a go. baseball cap here, which I will be bringing to you when I see you in September. Oh, that's my one? Yes. Very good. I like that. And it's a, uh, so you look like you're a member of that Hocus Focus Corp. Corp. The, yeah. Now that you're in the hood. Yeah. Oh, but yeah. by the way, it looks like, you look like, an East, an East, you look, yeah, it looks like the Hocus Focus uh, security services. When, when I mean, we... I'll get a matching one if you want, and we can. Uh... <laughs> no, what, what, what we'll do is when we get a, uh, when we do conferences in, in, down the road, we can have the security staff dressed like this. Oh yeah, yeah, and we'll be kitted out. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. everything, underpants, everything, you name it, we'll have them on. Focus, focus, pepper spray. Okay, <laughs> as ever, it's in the link below if you want to get some of that description box if you want to purchase this stuff. As is the Amazon uh, affiliate links for the books and books. I, my Dublin accent came out there. Books and um, Twitter. We're on Twitter. Don't forget. I'm trying to get it more active, but I will. It's, I think we've got up to 300 people on that now, but it's only just opened. And uh, we have a book coming out soon, which is in the final stages. And uh, that's going to be fab. I really, both really enjoyed writing it. And also, uh, well, thank you for everything, for being here, enjoying the show. Big thanks to Christian for being on. I really like the man and I really respect him as a person. And hopefully he'll continue talking about the Borderlands on his own channel, Odyssey. I'll try and get him to do that. And then I'll put the link through so you can follow over there and subscribe and follow over there. And um, yeah, thanks very much. Yes, and just to echo what Thomas said, thank you for watching. And don't forget to keep your thoughts and um, opinions on what we've talked about and put them in the comments and in the live chat as well, because that's always fun. They're always fun to read. Might not be able to answer them all, but they do get read. And thanks to Christian for coming on. That was really fun. I enjoyed that. And he's over on Odyssey on Christian Morris TV. So give him a follow because he has some really, really interesting um, podcasts over there. And because he's not on YouTube, he can get really close to the bone and close to the knuckle and doesn't have to censor himself and he doesn't have to use a made up language to fool the algorithms. He just speaks it. Speaks and he also makes funny cartoons and things like that. Yes. He's great. He's great. And now before we go, Sarah, what is the tarot card this week? Tarot card this week is a very nice one. It is the Page of Cups. And the page is wearing a blue tunic with water lilies all over it. And these water lilies are a symbol of purity, which tell us that the page is pure of heart, like a child. And he's wearing a beret on his head and a scarf that's flowing in the wind. And I interpret the scarf as being intuition coming from the subconscious and into the conscious mind. And he's standing by the shore and behind him, you've got the waves of the sea representing the fluidity of emotions. And what's really interesting on the card is that he's holding a golden cup in his right hand with a fish poking its head out. The fish and the sea are all symbols of water, which are to do with creativity and intuition, feelings and emotions, that sort of thing. All of those things that come from deep inside. And the mood of the Page of Cups is playful and lightheartedness, which are the key meanings of this card. And the fish popping up out of the cup is a small reminder that creative ideas don't always come when you expect them to. Sometimes they can just pop up out of the blue and surprise you, kind of like what the fish is doing in the card. So this card is saying, be open and curious and you might receive some unexpected 
inspiration out of the blue. And it connects beautifully to our earlier segment about psychic hygiene. Remember I talked about reclaiming your creativity? Well, that's where this ties in. Just like the, the card wants you to be open to intuition, reclaiming your art also opens you up to your intuition. And it's about allowing your inner child to shine and believing that even something that you thought might be impossible could just well be within reach now. So think like a child and let your imagination and creativity flow because this card is the herald of new projects and opportunities. And despite it being something that you're not expecting, go for it. And if you do, it could lead to new adventures and new doors. It can also mean an unexpected and pleasant surprise. In the tarot, the pages are messengers. And with the page of cups, the message is connected to emotions, intuition or your creativity. And it could also represent a marriage proposal or engagement, a new baby, an unexpected promotion, a Luciferian moment, an idea that seems to have just dropped into your conscious mind. An idea that just seems to have dropped into your conscious mind out of the blue. If you do receive a flash of inspiration, then you have to take the necessary steps to bring the thought or idea into being, though. And you need to do this through action because creative ideas can come, but without any action, they'll just fade away and stay pipe dreams. So trust your gut and take any necessary steps needed for this. Stay open to all possibilities, even if they do seem out of the ordinary. This is a reminder that sometimes the most remarkable experiences come when we venture beyond our comfort zone. That also ties in very nicely with this Pluto archetype as well. Uh, unexpected shifts, changes, information. And information aspect, he's, in, he's also associated with intelligence. Intelligence gathering, get information. You need information. He's the man to get it for you. He's like a James Bond almost. He's almost like a, a clandestine agent who will get information you need that's not otherwise accessible to you. In the, uh, you know, he he he's, he he's somebody who's rel- he's like Huggy Bear in Starsky and Hutch. He gets you the word on the street that you don't know. Uh, so it's a really cool card that one. They're very appropriate for the psychic weather too. Okay, everybody, that's another show and. Uh, Thank you for being here, and we'll see you next week on Sarah Monda Eni's channel, Wuthering Nights with Sarah Monda Eni. And get, get, you know, get, get sharing, loving, reading, enjoying, researching, paranormaling, hauntology, ing, and also Fortean. It's, it's, uh, you've got a life and uh, make it as strange as possible. Good night. Good night. See you next week.